Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and we're going to be talking today about mosaic attenuation of the lung parenchyma. So the goals and objectives of this lecture are first to define what is mosaic attenuation and mosaic perfusion actually mean. I often see these terms used interchangeably, and that's technically not correct, so we want to kind of clear up any sort of confusion about these terms. We want to try to differentiate between ground glass opacity and mosaic perfusion on CT. So how can we differentiate confidently between these two entities on CT? We want to try to develop an approach to distinguish the two main etiologies of mosaic perfusion. That is an algorithm that we could apply to CT to help us come down firm on one of these two etiologies. And then learn the differential for each of these etiologies. So let's first talk about mosaic attenuation. So mosaic attenuation is defined by the Fleischner Society Glossary, a paper written in 2011. It's defined as a patchwork of regions of differing attenuation on CT of the lungs. Okay, so let's talk about mosaic attenuation. So mosaic attenuation just basically means that there's dense and loosened areas within the lung parenchyma. So here's a schema on our right-hand side where we see both dense, represented by white, and loosened areas within the lung parenchyma. Note that when we talk about mosaic attenuation, it does not specify what portion of the lung is abnormal. All it's saying is that we're acknowledging the fact that there's both areas of density and lucency within the lung. If we think that the denser areas, so these areas in here, are abnormal, we would call that ground glass opacity. If we think that the more lucent areas of the lung are abnormal, so that these areas in here are abnormal, we would call that mosaic perfusion. So then when we think about mosaic attenuation, there's two broad categories underneath it. There's mosaic perfusion and ground glass opacity. Ground glass opacity representing abnormally dense areas of lung and mosaic perfusion representing abnormally loosened areas of the lung. Oftentimes people use the term mosaic perfusion and mosaic attenuation interchangeably. This is not correct. Mosaic attenuation can either be mosaic perfusion or ground glass opacity. Mosaic perfusion is a more specific finding that we see on chest CT, and we have to try to differentiate mosaic perfusion from ground glass opacity. So let's first talk about ground glass opacity. So what is ground glass opacity? Ground glass opacity represents abnormally dense areas of lung that does not obscure underlying bronchovascular abnormality. And we can see that here on the CT on the right. We can see that there are areas of abnormally dense lung that does not obscure or distort underlying airways or vessels. This is what we would say is ground glass opacity. Mosaic perfusion, on the other hand, represents abnormally lucent lung. So we can see here that the lungs are just way too lucent. We can see that there's a paucity of vessels, the vessels are too smaller in size, and the lungs are just diffusely hyperlucent. This is widespread mosaic perfusion. So then when do we use the term mosaic attenuation? So we use it initially as a descriptive term. So we could see it on CT, as in this CT on the right, we could say that there is a widespread mosaic attenuation abnormality. But our job is to try to be a little bit more specific. That is, are we looking at ground glass opacity, so the denser areas, or are we looking at mosaic perfusion, the more loosened areas? So then the question is, is how do we differentiate reliably between ground glass opacity and mosaic perfusion on a routine CT? And the answer to that is we have to look at the vessel size. This is the most important thing that we can do to differentiate between ground glass opacity and mosaic perfusion on a routine chest CT. So what's the rationale for looking at vessel size? Well, our lungs are pretty smart. They try to redirect blood flow away from abnormal areas. What that means is, is that the vessels will be, in, will be smaller in size in areas of abnormal lung parenchyma. So how does this apply to mosaic perfusion? So remember, mosaic perfusion means that in the setting of mosaic attenuation, the abnormal lung is the lucent lung. Mosaic perfusion actually rep represents vascular oligemia. The reason why the lungs look lucent is because the vessels are too small in size and less numerous. That lung looks lucent because it's being underperfused and therefore looks blacker on CT. So here's a schema on the right where we can see that this is the lung parenchyma. And again, we see a diffuse mosaic attenuation abnormality. We see lucent and we see more dense areas. So then what we have to do is look at the size of the vessels. And when we look at the size of the vessels, we can see that the vessels are generally smaller in size, smaller in size, 
and less numerous within the loosened areas compared to the more dense areas where the vessels are larger in size and more numerous. Therefore, we would say that this lung demonstrates a diffuse mosaic attenuation abnormality on the basis of mosaic perfusion, and we think it's mosaic perfusion because the vessels are smaller in size and less numerous in the more lucent or blacker areas of the lung parenchyma. Ground glass opacity, on the other hand, means that the lung that's abnormal is the denser or whiter lung. In this case, the vessels are generally equal throughout the lung parenchyma, and that's typically because ground glass opacity represents an acute abnormality and the body hasn't had time to shunt blood away from the abnormally dense areas within the lung. And that's what we see in this schematic on the right. We can see that the vessels are generally equal in size throughout, both in size and number throughout the lung parenchyma. So if we were to describe this abnormality, we would say again, there's a widespread mosaic attenuation abnormality that we favor to be on the ground glass, in the, on the basis of ground glass opacity, as the vessels generally appear equal in size throughout. So let's take a look at some CTs to help us differentiate between these two entities. So let's first take a look at this CT here we have on the left. So on the left, we can see that, again, there's a mosaic attenuation abnormality within the lung parenchyma. We can see that there's areas of dense lung and areas of lucent lung. So one of the things I first do when I see mosaic attenuation abnormality is look at the lucent lung. And when we look at the lucent lung, we can see that the vessels within the lucent lung are generally smaller in size and less numerous than the larger and more numerous vessels within the denser lung. That would imply that the lung that is lucent is the abnormal lung. This is a mosaic perfusion abnormality. So the lucent lung is abnormal, and the dense lung, even though it looks abnormally dense, is actually normal lung parenchyma. So this is normal lung parenchyma with large arteries inside of it, and this is abnormal lung parenchyma that appears hyperlucent with smaller vessels. On the other end, we have another case of mosaic attenuation where we could see that there's kind of a heterogeneous appearance of the lung with areas of both increased density and some subtle lucency. So what do we have to do? We have to look at the vessels. And when we look at the vessels, the vessels are generally even in size and distribution throughout the lung parenchyma. This would then imply that perhaps we're looking at a ground glass abnormality within the lung parenchyma. So this is a diffuse ground glass abnormality, and this is a mosaic perfusion abnormality. Here's a more subtle case. So we could see again that there is a mosaic attenuation abnormality within the lung parenchyma. We see areas of both lucent lung as well as more dense lung. So now we have to decide what do we think is the abnormal lung. So again, we always start with the lucent lung and we have to make a judgment. Do we think that these vessels are smaller and less numerous in size than the vessels within the denser appearing lung? And the answer to that is yes. We just see a lot less vessels than we would typically expect, and they do appear smaller in size than vessels in denser areas of the lung parenchyma. This again is a diffuse mosaic perfusion abnormality. Where is the normal lung? The normal lung is the denser lung. Where is the abnormal lung? It is the more lucent lung. So to recap, mosaic attenuation is a general term. Underneath mosaic attenuation, we could either have mosaic perfusion or ground glass opacity, ground glass opacity being abnormally dense lung, mosaic perfusion being abnormally lucent lung. So for ground glass opacity, the causes for it could be acute or chronic, and the differential here is fairly broad. We'll have to reserve this for another talk. What I want to spend more time talking about today is the causes of mosaic perfusion. So underneath mosaic perfusion, there are two main categories. The two main categories are air trapping, also known as small airways disease, or obstructive vascular disease. So let's talk about each of these. So the first thing to realize is that mosaic perfusion is the result of vascular oligemia. Both air trapping and obstructive vascular disease resu result in a perfusional abnormality within the lung parenchyma. Both obstructive vascular disease and air trapping cause vascular oligemia, hence the name mosaic perfusion. How does air trapping do this? Air trapping does this with hypoxic vasoconstriction. So the areas that are air trapped are not being correctly aerated, so the body wants to shunt blood away from those areas. When it shunts blood away from those areas, the vessels in that area that's air trapped become smaller in size and less numerous. Because they're smaller in size and less numerous, that lung is underperfused, and because it's underperfused, it'll appear hyperlucent on CT. Obstruct, obstructive vascular disease, on the other hand, is usually the result of some sort of direct vascular obstruction. 
because the vessels are being obstructed in those areas, again, that area is going to be underperfused, the vessels are going to appear smaller in size, and the lungs are generally going to appear more loosened. So it's important to recognize, again, that mosaic perfusion means vascular oligemia, which could be on the basis of air trapping or obstructive vascular disease. What a lot of people do when they first look, use these terms is think they see the word perfusion and automatically associate that with obstructive vascular disease. They use these terms synonymously, and that's incorrect. Mosaic perfusion can be the result of air trapping or obstructive vascular disease. Both of these processes result in vascular oligemia. So now how can we differentiate between air trapping and obstructive vascular disease. We have to use some clues on CT. Because we're talking about air trapping, we want to focus on the airways. So we look for airway abnormalities. So what are some airway abnormalities that we can see? So we could see bronchial wall thickening. We could see areas of bronchiectasis. And we define bronchiectasis as a bronchial to arterial ratio of greater than one to one. So the airway here, we could see, is clearly larger in size than the adjacent artery. This is bronchiectasis. We could also look for some tree and bud opacities. Tree and bud opacities representing exudative or impacted very distal airways, producing this kind of branching nodular opacity. So this is what we call a tree and bud opacity. In addition, when we look at mosaic perfusion related to air trapping, more often than not, we actually see this kind of lobular appearance meaning that the mosaic perfusion we see tends to kind of be very lobular and well-marginated and geographic in appearance. So we can see these areas of hyperlucency within the lung here that are kind of patchy and lobular. This is a more typical appearance of mosaic perfusion related to air trapping. Mosaic perfusion related to obstructive vascular disease, we think of something wrong with the arteries. Therefore, we want to look for things wrong with the pulmonary arteries. So one of the things that we could look for is an enlarged main pulmonary artery. So here we can see that the main pulmonary artery is large in size. We typically use around three centimeters as a cutoff, but a more specific marker is to actually compare the size of the aorta with the size of the pulmonary artery. If the pulmonary artery is larger than one-to-one -one with the adjacent aorta, that is a very specific sign for pulmonary arterial hypertension, and that's one of the signs that we can use in the setting of mosaic perfusion to favor obstructive vascular disease. We could also look for enlarged intraparenchymal or segmental pulmonary arteries, where we could see that this artery is much larger than the adjacent airway. We could look for bronchial artery hypertrophy, and we see hypertrophy bronchial arteries in the ascending obstructive vascular disease because the pulmonary arteries are having a hard time supplying the lung parenchyma, so they recruit additional arteries. And those arteries that they can recruit are the bronchial arteries. So we can see these big squiggly arteries coming off the aorta, going into the lung parenchyma, representing bronchial artery hypertrophy. And then lastly, as far as distribution, if we compare this to their previous case, the distribution for obstructive vascular disease tends to be more confluent and peripheral. So in this setting, we can see that the abnormal lung is all the lucent lung out here, and the normal lung is the denser lung in here. And all this abnormal lucent lung, again representing mosaic perfusion, is very confluent and peripheral. So it's out in the periphery of the lung and very confluent, as opposed to the more patchy and lobular appearance of mosaic perfusion related to air trapping. So in review, some clues that we can use for focusing on air trapping from causing a mosaic perfusion abnormality could be related to the airways, such as bronchial wall thickening, bronchiectasis, tree and bud opacities, as well as a patchy and lobular distribution. For obstructive vascular disease, we want to focus on the arteries, so enlarged main and intraparenchymal pulmonary arteries, bronchial artery hypertrophy, as well as the distribution being more confluent and peripheral. So not in all cases is it easy to differentiate based on secondary signs as to the cause of mosaic perfusion. That is, is it air trapping or is it related to some sort of obstructive vascular disease? So in these scenarios where we're not sure, we could use expiration imaging. And we can use expiration imaging to help us differentiate air trapping from obstructive vascular disease. So how does this work? So expiration imaging is acquired first with your typical inspiratory CT scan. Immediately after your inspiratory CT scan, a second CAT scan is acquired of the chest in expiration. That is, you ask the patient to breathe out, and then the study is acquired while they're breathing out, holding their breath as they blow it out. There's different ways to acquire this. You can either do it as a continuous expiration imaging, that is, you ask them to blow out their breath, and then image the entire chest from top to bottom continuously. 
you could ask them to breathe out and then image the chest in pieces. So you can image a few slices in the upper lung zones, a few slices in the mid lung zones, and a few slices in the lower lung zones to help reduce dose. Or you could also do dynamic expiration imaging. And in dynamic expiration imaging, what you could do is focus on, say, three areas of the chest. And when you're focusing on one particular area, you actually continuously CT that area as the patient breathes out. And this way you could actually watch the lung go from air-filled to airless in one area. So once we have expiration imaging, we can look for some signs that we expect to see. So some of the things that we expect to see with expiration imaging is that if we focus on the trachea, so here's our normal inspiration, the posterior wall of the trachea during inspiration should be bowed outward, okay, rather so convex border outward. During, in, during expiration, on the other hand, when the patient breathes out, we expect the posterior wall of the trachea to bow inward. And this is one of the ways that we could tell if we're looking at an expiratory scan, is if we focus on the posterior wall of the trachea. When we look at the lung parenchyma, what we expect to see is that the lung parenchyma should go from dense, sorry, from more loosened to more dense. And the reason why it's going from loosened to more dense is because we're blowing that air out. And as we blow that air out, the lung becomes less air filled and more atelectatic. And when it becomes more atelectatic, it develops areas of what look like ground glass opacity. But this is just normally airless lung. This is normally airless lung. So how does this work with expiration imaging? How this works with expiration imaging for air trapping is that on the inspiratory CT, it may generally look normal or you may see what looks like a subtle mosaic perfusion abnormality. As the patient breathes out, the normal lung will become denser in appearance. And that's what we could see here. This is normal lung becoming denser because it's becoming airless. The patient is breathing air out. The lung that is air trapped, however, actually remains very black. And the reason why it remains black is because it's not becoming atelectatic. It's not becoming atelectatic because it's air trapped. So if we were to take some attenuation values, the attenuation value, say in this region here, would be minus 850. The attenuation value in this region in here will say it will be, you know, minus 900. Then we go to expiration CT. And because this lung is losing air, it's going to become more dense. So we'll go from minus 850 to say minus 650. This lung, however, is not becoming more dense. It's air trapped, so we'll stay at minus 900. Now, if we compare the two differences, so here the difference is only a Hounsfield unit of 50. If we compare the difference here, the Hounsfield unit is going to be 250. That's why your eyes see this so much more clearly is because the attenuation has changed dramatically. So what do we see when we go from inspiration to expiration is that the delta between the air trap lung and the normal lung becomes accentuated. We went from minus 50 to minus 250. Okay, so let's finally talk about some causes of mosaic perfusion. So underneath mosaic perfusion, again, we have air trapping and obstructive vascular disease. Underneath air trapping, the big three that you need to know are asthma, bronchiolitis obliterans, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Under obstructive vascular disease, the big one being chronic pulmonary embolic disease, followed by any cause really of pulmonary arterial hypertension, including idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So in conclusion, it's important to remember that mosaic attenuation is a general term used for lung parenchyma that is both dense and lucent, and does not imply which portion of the lung is abnormal. Mosaic perfusion, on the other hand, is defined as abnormally lucent lung due to vascular oligemia. Vascular oligemia could be caused either due to air trapping or obstructive vascular disease. And we could use some CT clues, such as the appearance of the airways and pulmonary arteries, as well as expiration imaging to help us differentiate between these two main categories. Here are some additional reading assignments that you can take a look at. And if there's any additional questions, you could reach me by email. Thank you.